Turn your Bibles to the book of Haggai in the Old Testament, the book of Haggai. And the way to find it is right in between the two Z's there towards the end of your Old Testament. And so the book of Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. It's right between Zephaniah and Zechariah is where you'll find it at. All right. Now, I told you that last week I gave out some gas cards. And I told you tonight I'm going to give out some money. And so I've got $100 here all in $20 bills that I'm going to give out to some people tonight. And so we're going to go ahead and and, and take care of that right now. And uh, so i got to figure out how I'm going to give it out. Last week, I kind of gave it out to people that drove the longest or had some of the greatest needs. And so I was trying to figure out, well, how am I going to do this tonight? And so I decided, well, the best thing to do is to, what's that? (laughs) Family size. Okay, we'll start with the smallest families first. (laughs) All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give out this first $20 bills, and since he spoke up, I'm going to give it to Brother Mike Sears, and I'm going to give it to him so the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive, so I'm going to give it to him so he can give it to somebody else. So Mike, who are no, not family, can't give it to family here. All right, so who are you going to give that $20 bill to? Uh, to? Give it to Ensner. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know if staff can get this or not. I think there's rules somewhere on that. All right, so we'll try another one here. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and give this to Garrett. And Garrett, you get to pick who to give it to. So uh, who are you? You're going to give it to Miss Indy? All right, there you go. That was easy. All right, let's see. Uh, the next one here, I'm going to go ahead and give this one to David. I'm going to give it to you over here. So you get to pick who you get to give it to. So, All right. <laughs> So who do you want to give it to there? All right, going to give it to two folks. All right, let's see. I haven't done anyone on this side over here, so I'm going to pick Titus, our intern. And Titus, who you want to give this to has been really nice to you and done some nice things for you as well. All right. Oh, I'm going to give it to Garrett. All right, let's see. I've got one left here, and so two I'm going to give it to you to give to somebody. So who do you want to give this to? You got to pick somebody out there. All right. All right. Give it to Chris over there. Good. All right. So the Bible does say it's more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, sometimes that's hard to believe that when your bills are stacking up and when inflation is happening and, and uh, you don't have enough money left over at the end of the month. But I want to challenge you that even during these difficult times, uh, don't stop giving. Uh, Don't stop giving your tithe and your offering to the Lord. God promises he'll bless us when we give. Uh, The Malachi chapter 3, he talks about the the physical blessings, but more importantly, in in, um, in Philippians, it talks about the spiritual blessings and 2 Corinthians as well. And so God wants to bless us in our giving. And not only your tithes and your offerings, but look around. There are people that are in need right now. And even though you and I may be struggling a little bit, with how much we have and, and the bills coming in. And I think I read somewhere that the average family is costing them four to $500 more per month than it did a year ago. And I know that's a challenge, but there's many families that are on very fixed incomes and uh, cannot increase their income and have very little to work in their budget. And so uh, look around and, and make sure you pay attention to those who are in need and be giving to them as well. But I want to look at Haggai chapter 1 and begin with verse number 3. It says, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye, that to dwell in your sealed houses, and uh, this house lay in, lie in waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways, go up to the mountains, and bring wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we pray as we open up your word tonight that you would open it to our hearts and to our lives. Lord, I I pray there's many families, and even some right here in our church, that are struggling financially right now with inflation and with the the depression and, and that's uh, possibly coming, and recession. And we pray that you would just provide for their needs physically. And we pray, we, we know that you're faithful to take care of us. We seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto us. But Lord, we pray that you provide those needs. And may we look for opportunities to be a blessing to others during this difficult time as well. But Lord, we also ask you to help us to apply the 
the same principles we're having to apply in our finances to our spiritual needs. And, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this passage is a great passage to use if you're talking about doing a building project for the church or you're talking about the, you need to do some things in the building. And, I, and I'm not here to talk about that area. What I'd like to talk about is something that we're all thinking about right now, and, and that's the, the whole inflation and possible recession and, and things that are happening in our economy right now. In 3 John chapter 1 and verse number 2, the Bible said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Uh, John's desire was that, that the people he was writing to, that they be prosperous in their, in their financial needs, that they be prosperous in their health. But he said, more important than both of those is that your soul prospers. And, and I know right now a lot of us are struggling financially and, and, and having to figure out how to stretch our budget further and how to work through these issues that are going on. And, and um, I'm praying for you in that area and, and uh, asking God to just give wisdom and grace and meet each of our needs. But it's also a time to look at our spiritual health and how we're doing. Uh, somebody once said that an economic slowdown is when someone loses their job. And a recession is when your neighbor loses his job. And a depression is when you lose your job. And I thought that was a good description. And we're hearing now in the news the possibility we're heading into a recession and possibly even a, a depression. Uh, I'm not a prophet. I don't know what's going to happen. We've been through this before. I remember back in the uh, 80s this was happening. Back in 2008 it happened as well. It seemed like the economy was just dropping out and everybody was worried where we're going to end up. And, 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 and we came back again and it's probably going to happen again as well. Uh, but we do want to, you know, it is wise to consider what you're going to do to deal with the economic crisis because it is a reality. Uh, average families paying four to five hundred dollars more per month than they were a year ago, and and uh, it looks like that's not going to stop. It's going to keep going up. And so, how do we deal with that? Is a is an issue that you have to look at, and that's one of the reasons we offer the Financial Peace University class. It's got a lot of good information there that can help you during a time like this, and it's not too late to join up. We're meeting here at the church this next Tuesday, and you're welcome to come out for that as well. But um, I want to apply the same principles we're looking at with our finances to our spiritual lives. I want you to look at your spiritual life. Are you in a spiritual downturn? Are you heading for a spiritual recession? Is it possible that you're even on your way to a depression spiritually? You know, when you have a slowdown in your spiritual life, uh, it, it's a downturn. It's when things are, are heading down rather than up. And your savings is going down, your, your money and your budget is going down. When you have that sp slowdown in your physical life, uh, the same thing happens in our spiritual life. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, will heal their land. Now, we're hearing about all kinds of solutions that we need to raise taxes, we need to cut taxes, we need to raise spending, we need to cut spending. We're hearing all kinds of things from different sides of the political arena, and I'm not sure which of those is the real answer for our situation right now, but I can tell you this, the answer we need right now in America is to get right with God. And this is not a command to the unsaved, it's a command to Christians. And so we need to look at our spiritual lives and see where we're at spiritually. When you have an a, a, a economic downturn, there's, there's a couple of different areas you look at to decide that. And, and the first one is in spending. Uh, when you're spending more, uh, that's an economic downturn. When you're, it's costing you more and you have money, less money, free money to spend, and you have to learn how to handle your spending. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, you show me your checkbook and you show me what you're spending your money on, and I will tell you what's important to you. You show me your checkbook, you show me what you're spending your money on, I can tell you what's important to you. And there's two, two areas that tell what's important in your life. It's not only your money, but your time. It's what you spend your money on and what you spend your time on. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 2, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me that ye eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. 
A lot of us are having to take a look at where we're spending our money and say, is this where I want to spend my money? Is this what's most important to me? Or do I need to use that money more wisely in another area? And we need to do the same thing with looking at the time that we spend. And when you're in a spiritual downturn, when you're a spiritual slowdown in your life, you need to look at where you're spending your time. Are you spending your time reading your Bible? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse number 13, it says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. In verse number 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. And, and so, first of all, we need to make sure that we're spending our time in the Word of God. Because if you're not spending time in your Bible, you're in a spiritual downturn. You're, you're, you're heading down in your spiritual life. And so you need, we need to recheck and relook. Do I spend time reading the Word of God? Do I spend time studying the Word of God? Do I spend time meditating upon the Word of God? Uh, we need to spend time in our Bible. But we also need to spend time in prayer. In Job chapter 21 and verse number 15, what is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto Him? Well, what happens a lot of times in our spiritual life is we get to a place where we, we, we think, well, I pray and nothing happens. And, and we stop praying. And when we stop praying, that's when we're starting to head down spiritually. And, and so do you spend time in prayer? I know in my life, it's so easy to get out of the habit of doing that daily prayer walk and spending time and praying for people. It, it's so easy to get busy in life and get focused on other things. And, and I notice in my own life, when I'm not praying, that's a spiritual downturn for me. That's, that's a problem in my life. That's a slowdown spiritually. And so we need to spend time in the Word of God. We need to spend time praying. And we also need to spend time in doing good works. In Titus chapter 3 and verse number 8, it says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou firm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And we need to spend time doing good works. Have you spent time? How much time did you spend this week doing good works? How much time did you spend this week being a blessing to other people and helping out other people and being an encouragement to others? How much time did you spend in, in reaching people for Christ? We need to spend time in good works. One of the signs of an economic downturn is when people stop spending. And a spiritual downturn is when we stop spending time in the Word of God, and we stop spending time in prayer, and we stop spending time in doing good works. And you know, the challenges we've had is the last couple of years, that's been difficult to do. For a while there, we couldn't go to church. and For a while there, we, we couldn't go out and do things for other people, but now we have that opportunity. And if we want to turn things around, you've got to start spending time in these three areas. And so I want to challenge you tonight. How much time are you spending in the Word of God? reading, studying, memorizing, meditating upon the Word of God? How much time are you spending hearing the Word of God? Faith come by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. How much time are you spending in prayer? And how much time are you spending in good works? But there's another um, area they look at to decide if it's an economic downturn, and that's how much money are we saving? How much money are we saving? Um, saving rate dropped from 16.3% in 2020 down to 4.4% today. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're having an economic downturn, is, is you need to save. In Acts chapter 2, and verses 46 and 47, it says, And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and signals of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added the church daily such to be saved. If we're not seeing people saved, we're in a spiritual slowdown. If we're not seeing people saved as a church, if we're not seeing people saved as individuals, we are in a spiritual slowdown. We need to see souls saved. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 30 says, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. God says when you're winning souls, that's a good thing. And if you haven't led anybody to the Lord, if you haven't given out, if you're not giving out tracts, if you're not inviting people to church, uh, that's a that's a spiritual slowdown in your life. And if you want to get things turned around, you've got to start passing out tracts, and you've got to start inviting people to church, and you've got to start witnessing to people and telling them about Jesus Christ. Because we need to invest in souls. In First Thessalonians chapter two, verses nineteen and twenty. 
It says, for what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are glory and joy. See, one day when you die and go to heaven, your glory, your joy is going to be those that you've led to Christ. It's going to be the blessing of seeing souls that you witnessed to, that you invited out to church, that, that you told about Jesus Christ, that, that you gave your testimony to. This is going to be the blessing of seeing souls come to Christ. And if you're not seeing souls saved, it's, if it's been months and years and longer since you've seen anybody come to Christ or come to church because of your personal witness and your testimony, then you're in a spiritual downturn. You're in a spiritual slump. And you need to get back in the habit of giving out tracts. Do you carry tracts with you everywhere you go? And do you pass them out to people to say, Pastor, does that work? I can tell you without a doubt it works. I can tell you about person after person has been saved because they read a gospel track. I went to Bible college with a guy that was given a gospel track at work, and that's what led to him getting saved. Uh, we had uh, people here in the church over the years that have gotten gospel tracks on a bus and gotten them in their car. I remember one year uh, around uh, Christmas time, a little before Christmas, my family, and I was really early on back in the 80s when we started the church, we went out to uh, a parking lot at the NEX and we put tracks in people's windshields of the car. Now, I don't put them in the windshields anymore. I put them in the little crack by the door uh, so it's easier for them to get because people don't like it. You know, you get in your car and then you see the paper there and you got to get out of your car and get the track. You're upset with that. And sometimes, and the other thing is, is that we found out later on, nobody came to church because of those tracks that we knew of. But in February, there was a young couple that came to church. And when I asked them, well, how did you hear about the church? They said it was the strangest thing. We were washing our car and we found one of your tracks down inside. They had the hiding windshield wipers and the, and the track was shoved down inside where the hiding windshield wipers were. And we pulled it out of there. It was all faded and worn, but we could see the name of the church. And, and, and they said, we had been, just been talking about, we need to get into church. And, and they came as a result of that. And as I talked to them further later on, as I got to know them, and they, became, they got saved, became regular active members of the church. And as I got to know them, they said, Pastor, if we had found that track, because as far as we could tell, the church was small then, it was, and we were the ones that put out the last tracks. And that's the only place we could figure out where they got a track in their windshield. And, and uh, they said, Pastor, if we found that track in December, we would have thrown it away. But when we found it in February, we're at a point in our life where we knew we needed God in our life. And, and that's the Lord. That's what the Lord does. But if you're not passing out tracts, and if you're not inviting people to church every week, if you're not sharing your testimony, if you're not witnessing to people and giving them the gospel, you are in a spiritual downturn. You've got to invest in souls. Souls are, they'll give you the greatest return. One of the problems I have with investing is I'm always concerned, is that the best return? Are you, are you that way as well? You know, we've been looking at putting some money into a CD, some, some, some of our short-term savings in the CD, and uh, of course, you go around, CD rates for a long time have been less than 1% or just 1%. We found one for 1.65%. We thought, we'll invest there, and then I saw they're raising the interest rates, so I'm thinking, well, maybe I should wait a little bit longer to invest, you know, and, and, uh, and then with your finances, too, the same thing. We're, we've got investments for our retirement, and a lot of them are stock market, and if, you, if you're paying attention at all, the money's going down instead of up right now. Uh, it's not working the best right now, but uh, they say this is the best time to invest when, when stocks are cheap, and then when they go back up, which is the history, then you're, you'll have your money in a good investment. But it's always a worry, is this the right thing to invest in? But I'll tell you what, the one thing you'll always get a great return on is winning a soul to Christ. In Psalms 126, verses 5 and 6, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. When you hear somebody because of your testimony, because of your witness, because you invited them to church, because you gave them a gospel track and they get saved, that's the greatest return you'll ever get. A few weeks back, we took a new couple out to dinner and we were sitting down talking to them and I was asking them about their, their background. And when I, when I talk to people, one of the things I found is a good way to do this, to introduce it, is I'll ask them, what's your, what's your church background? Because people that are saved will generally, most cases, tell you, well, we went to church when I was little, I got saved, and they'll tell you when they got saved. 
And people that are not saved, they'll talk about going to church, but they won't tell you about when they got saved. And so it's a good way to kind of open up that conversation to find out whether they're saved or not. And, and so I would ask them, well, did you grow up going to church? And they began talking. And the lady looked at me and says, well, yeah, I grew up going to church, but I didn't know anything about God. And I got saved on Easter Sunday at Ohana Baptist Church. And, and what a boy, I tell you what, I want to just cry right then. What a blessing to know that here's somebody that got saved at Easter Sunday. Uh, they prayed and asked the Lord to save them. And, and there's no greater return, there's no greater blessing than knowing that somebody you witnessed to, someone you invited out to church, someone that you gave a track to got saved. And if you're not saving, seeing souls saved, then you're in a spiritual downturn. You're also in spiritual downturn. Turn over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. When you're not giving, you're in a spiritual downturn. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, he says, What doth the prophet, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needed, Needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith that hath not works is dead being alone. When, you're, when you are giving, again, giving your tithe, giving your offering, but giving to the needs of others, that is a blessing. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's always a blessing to get something, but it's more of a blessing when you're able to give to somebody else. And I want to tell you, I want to ask you, what have you given this last week? It's not just giving financially, it's giving of yourself to help somebody out. Uh, there are families that are struggling. We, we, we're going to be asking you to provide meals uh, for the Beardsley family. I told you about the little two-year-old Bella who fell on her birthday yesterday and, and cracked her head open. And, and uh, they didn't have to do surgery, but she does. they think that she does have a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. And so they're going to be watching her. And, and we want to be there to provide for that family. And, and, and there are families during this economic times that are struggling financially and struggling. And, and, and we need to be ready to give. Because if you're not giving, you're in a spiritual slump. You're in a, in a spiritual downturn. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 14, it says, you have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we walk mournfully before the Lord of hosts? When we go through a time like this economically, one of the things that they're doing right now is raising the interest rates. And folks, when your interest goes up, that changes your spiritual life. Are you interested in being in church? Are you interested in getting involved in the outreach ministries? Are you interested in getting involved in some kind of ministry within the church? You see, you've got to get involved. See, a lot of times we look at this and say, well, what good is it to serve the Lord? Serving the Lord is what's going to keep you spiritually on track. See, when you're serving the Lord, you empty your cup and then God can fill it again. And you need to be interested and involved in what's going on. And then the third factor they look at in economic downturn is employment. In Philemon 1, verse 11, it says, Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to, me and thee, to thee and to me. See, when we're profitable, when we're gainfully employed. Now, unemployment today is at an all-time low. I mean, you can't find people. My wife, I was talking to my wife today, and she's uh, at her parents' house, uh, her parents in Minnesota, and, and they're both in care homes. And she said the home where her dad is, uh, they've lost workers. They've got one lady doing the job of four people because they can't find anybody to hire to do the job. And it's amazing right now. You go into restaurants, they don't have enough workers. You go just about everywhere you go, they're, they're screaming for somebody to work, to get involved. There are plenty of jobs to do right now, which is unusual in an economic slowdown. You know, you need to get to work. Because if you're not working, you're in an economic slowdown. You're a spiritual slowdown. Maybe some of you need to get to work again. Some of you used to be involved. You used to be serving the Lord. You used to be doing things and, and, and active and busy. I love what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. It says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. If you know the story of John Mark, John Mark was a, 
a, a young man that they took with them on their first missionary journey. And somewhere at the beginning of that journey, John Mark got, uh, he got homesick. It was a little too soon for him to leave his mother. And he, he left and went back home. He quit. And when Paul and Barnabas came back, this was Barnabas' nephew, and he wanted to give John Mark a second chance. And Paul said, nope, I don't want quitters around me. And Paul didn't want him. And it was such a, such a problem, they both went their separate ways. And what's amazing to me is that Paul would write here, bring Mark for his profit for ministry. Here's a young man that got back working, got busy again. And maybe some of you tonight need to start getting busy. What happens is being unemployed becomes a job. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And I think there's a lot of people today that quit their job and they're not working now, and that's causing trouble. And we need to get busy. We need to serve the Lord. Because if you're not serving, you're in a spiritual slump. You're in a spiritual downturn. And so I challenge you tonight to look at your life. What are the indicators in your life? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you giving? Are you doing good works? Are you busy serving the Lord? Go over to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Another indicator that we see today is not only these three things, but it's also that costs are going up. Have you noticed that, by the way? I went down to Home Depot the other day, and I bought two two-by-threes, which years ago would have cost me around $3, $3 and something cents, about three eighty nine dollars or something like that, just a year ago or so. And now it cost me $14 for two two-by-threes. My father-in-law said that when he built his house back in the 60s, he paid $0.69 cents per two-by-four. Uh, prices are going up. It's costing more. You go to the store and you're spending more money for less food, it seems like. In Luke chapter 14, and beginning with verse number 27, it says, And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sit not down first and count the cost, whether you have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he had laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And we need to count the cost. The news is talking about whether we're heading into a recession or not. I, I kind of think we're already there. But the official definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of decline of the gross national product. That's the official definition. I guess we haven't quite reached that yet. But folks, when it's been weeks since you picked up your Bible, when it's been days since you prayed, when you've missed church more than once in the last month, those are ind good indicators that you're beyond a spiritual downturn, a spiritual slump, and you're heading into a spiritual recession. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. When you miss just one day, you're already there. So when's the last time you read your Bible? When's the last time you prayed? Are you in a spiritual recession? In Psalms 119 verse 97, it says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. So how many days since you've opened the Word of God? In 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23, Samuel said, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. How many days has it been since you prayed? More than just praying over your food. Hebrews 10, 25, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. When we start missing church, we're in a spiritual recession. How long has it been since you invited someone to come with you to church? Acts 26, verses 18 and 19. 
Paul said, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, this is the next statement, listen to what it says, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. When's the last time you invited somebody to church? If it's been a week, you're in a spiritual recession. It's not just a downturn. It becomes a habit in our lives. And we need to make sure that we're right with God. In order to turn things around, I think one of the things that we have to do as Americans and as a country is get out of debt. Go over Romans chapter 4. It starts with the debt of our sin. In Romans chapter 4, and beginning with verse number 1, it says, What shall we say then, that Abraham our father is pertaining to flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory of, but not before God. For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies, the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We have a debt of sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. We can't afford to pay the debt of our sins. Only Jesus could do that. I love this passage. And if you mark in your Bible, you might want to underline in verse number three the word counted. In verse number four, the word reckoned. In verse number five, the word counted again. In verse number six, the word imputeth. In verse number eight, the word impute. And then down in verse number 10, it has the word reckoned again. And then in verse number 24, it has the word imputed. Uh, verse 22, 23, and 24, it has the word imputed. Those are all accounting terms in the Greek language. And, and what the Bible is saying, that, that salvation is where God takes your debt and puts it to his account, and he takes his righteousness and puts it to our accounts. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, But God has made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody came along and said, I want to pay all of your debt? And not only that, I want to give you this credit card that will cover any future debts. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He paid it in full. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it says, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And I'm thankful that he paid it all. He paid my debt upon the cross. And I hope that you have imputed his righteousness to your account. But turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Here's the key that we need to understand. I believe that most, if not all here tonight, are already saved. If you're not, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. You need to put your faith in him. But Matthew chapter 6 is what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. In verse number 9, it says, After this manner, therefore, pray you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debtors, our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, it's important to understand that this was not meant to be a prayer that was repeated at funerals or at church services over and over again. I don't think it's necessarily wrong to do that, but this was not meant as a prayer. It was meant as an outline. I believe what he's given us here is an outline of how we pray, and he went through and explained these are the things that you should be praying for. But you know what's interesting? is after he gave them the prayer, there's only one thing that he felt he had to explain to them. And that was in verse number 14. It says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, 
your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And I'm here to tell you tonight that if you are not willing to forgive somebody, you're in debt. And when you're in debt, you're in an economic, a spiritual recession. And the only way to get out of that is to forgive. Because if you don't forgive them, God says, I'm not going to forgive you. Now, he's not talking about our salvation, but he's saying, listen, if you want to be right with me, you've got to be right with others as well. And I'm here to tell you tonight that you need to take care of that debt and forgive. In Romans chapter 1, <coughs> verses 14 through 16, it says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation, everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also the Greek. You and I, we are debtors to the unsaved. There are people out there, your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, your family, people that you meet every day that you owe the debt that somebody paid in your life. There's someone that brought you the gospel. There's someone that told you how to be saved. There's someone that cared enough for your soul to tell you about Jesus. And you need to turn around and you need to pay that debt further. And if you're not a debtor to souls, then you're in a spiritual recession and you need to get right with God. One of the things we need to do is we need to make deposits. Go over to Philippians chapter 4. As I said, we're doing the financial peace class, and I've taken the class before, but my wife and I are taking it again because as we get on in age, we want to make sure that we've got our finances in order, and, and uh, we have to renew some things and refresh ourselves on some things. So I've been going through the class again. And he's been talking about, if you ever heard Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace, he talks about the baby steps. The first baby step is to get a $1,000 emergency fund so you don't have to borrow money anymore when an emergency comes up. And then the second step is to take everything you've got and pay off the debt and get that taken care of. And then the third step, step is to save up a, a, a three to six months emergency fund so that you don't have to go back into it yet again. You've got whatever emergency comes up, you've got the money for it. And then you begin saving for a house and saving for college for your kids and saving for your retirement and all the rest of that. And again, if you want to join the class, come out on this Tuesday night at uh, 715, right, Don? And uh, we'll be meeting here at the church in the library. You can come join us and learn more about that. And you can kind of catch up with the videos and all. And you can talk to Don Norson for more information on that. But but the important thing he emphasized, and I think it's right, is that if you want to have money when the bills come, if you want to have money when you need to buy something, the way to have it is not by pulling out your credit card. What's happened today with a lot of Christians is we trust in Visa more than we do in Jesus Christ. And when a problem happens, instead of getting on our knees and praying and say, God, I need you, we just pull out our credit card and say, I'll take, you know, let Visa take care of it or MasterCard take care of it. And we don't trust the Lord. And we need to learn how to trust the Lord and when, when those things come up. But yet also the Lord wants us to be ready. He wants us to, to plan ahead like, like in Proverbs it talks about the ants who, who lay up in store for, the, for their needs that are coming. And we need to learn to do that as well. But I want you to look at Philippians chapter 4 and I want you to look at verses 6 through 9. It says, Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And then verse 9 says, these things which, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. That word think in, the, in verse number 8, that comes from the same word back in Romans chapter 4, the word impute or to reckon. It's an accounting term. And in essence, what you could say is verse number 8 goes through and says that we're to deposit 
things that are true and honest, things that are just and pure, things that are good of good report and virtue and of praise. These are the things that we deposit in our life. So you can go down to any bank here in Hawaii and you can open a checking account for free. You can just go down and open up a checking account. But if you want to take money out of that checking account, you've got to deposit money into that checking account. Have you learned that yet? Some of you haven't got that quite figured out yet. If you want to take money out of the checking account, you've got to put money into the checking account. See, salvation is free. You can open up salvation in the bank of heaven. You can deposit your soul with Jesus Christ, and that's a gift of God, and you can do that for free, and you can know you're going to heaven. But if you want to draw upon the power of God, if you want to draw upon the things of God, you've got to make these deposits. And if you don't make the deposits, when the bills come and when the, when the needs come in your life, you've got nothing to draw upon. And so you've got to keep making deposits. And I don't know about you, but when I, when I deposit my ch- paycheck, it, it's gone. Somebody once said, money does talk. It says, goodbye. <laughs> and I've got to, I, there's a strange thing. I've got to keep putting money in to take money out. And the same thing is true spiritually. If you're not depositing these things in your spiritual life, then you're going to have nothing to draw upon, and you're going to be in an economic, a spiritual depression because you've got nothing to draw upon in the time of need. And so we need to build up that savings account. And, and you don't want to live where it's paycheck to paycheck, and you, you get the money in the bank and time to pay the bills. That's no way to live. Start building up that emergency fund. Start building up those deposits that are there to draw upon in your spiritual life. We watch the news, and there's a lot of talk about inflation, recession, and even depression. And I don't know for sure what's going to happen in the next few months. I don't think, think, think things are going to get better right away. I do think unless the Lord does something different, I think it'll be like other economic difficult times we've gone through will go down, but it will come back up. But there's no guarantees on that. And I know during this time, many of you are struggling. And, and again, if I can pray for you specifically on that, please let me know. And if there's something we can do to help you, we'll try to do that. But it's more important to evaluate how we're doing spiritually. Are you reading your Bible? How long has it been since you picked up your Bible and read it? When's the last time you sat down to study the Word of God? When's the last time you memorized a Bible verse? Do you spend time meditating upon the Word of God? If you're not, you're in a spiritual downturn. The longer it goes, it's going to head to a spiritual recession and depression. Do you pray? Do you pray every day? When you miss a day and two days and three days, you're heading the wrong direction. What about good works? What are you doing for others to serve the Lord? What about your giving? We don't want to head to a spiritual depression. We want to be blessed. Years ago and back in 2008 when we were going through the economic crisis of those days, our theme for the church was thriving, not just surviving. I don't want to survive. I want to thrive. And I believe that God can bless us even during difficult times like this, both financially and spiritually. Let's bow in prayer.